Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, and of course, any non-binary pals, to what I am calling Mary Poppins Month. Even though the sound of it is something quite atrocious, if you say it loud enough, you'll always sound precocious, super talented. Now, some might be thinking that this is a cheap ploy, seeing as how Mary Poppins Return is coming out just next month, but actually, I decided to do this because... P.L. Travers fascinates me. Ever since I saw Saving Mr. Banks, I have been quite interested in who she is. And, well, I rewatch a lot of the same stuff over and over and over again. And one of the things that I love to watch over and over again on YouTube is, well, pretty much everything by Lindsay Ellis, but in particular, her uh, video on Disney revisionism as it applies to Saving Mr. Banks. A kid who wants to feed the birds causes a bank run. Give it back! Give me back the money! The people shall seize the means of production! Feed the birds! So, at the end of the day, this video is inspired by Miss Ellis. I won't mention her video too much, although uh, there will be a few times. Just, you know, maybe a counter-argument or something I didn't pick up on. It's something like that. So, first week of Mary Poppins Month. Saving Mr. Banks, uh, where's my finger? There, Saving Mr. Banks, there it is, right there. In fact, I could probably knock it over if I, uh, no, I'm not gonna. So, Saving Mr. Banks is a 2013 biopic starring Emma Thompson and Tom Hanks as P.L. Travers and Walt Disney, respectively. The film's origins begin in 2002, when Australia's Essential Media and Entertainment releases a biography on P.L. Travers' life. Ian Colley, the head of EME's dramas and the producer behind The Shadow of Mary Poppins, sees that there is an obvious biopic there. He then hires Sue Smith to write a screenplay. After the BBC got involved and financed the film, they brought in Kelly Marcel, who would go on to be the scriptwriter for Fifty Shades of Grey, and one of the six scriptwriters for Venom. You will be this honest, legless, faithless thing, won't you? Rolling down the street. In the wind. Unfortunately, when they were making the movie, there was a bit of a snag. Since the Walt Disney Company, and well, Walt Disney himself, is such a prominent thing in the movie, and they wished to use the music from Mary Poppins, they had to get rights from Disney. Luckily, though, in 2012, Disney bought the production, provided behind-the-scenes material from the making of Mary Poppins, and, quote, they threw money at it. Shortly thereafter, John Lee Hancock would be brought in to direct. The film was released in late fall of 2013, bringing in $117.9 million to the film's budget of $35 million. This is not a movie that I got to see in theaters, unfortunately. I remember talking to one of the employees at the theaters, and they said they wanted, the, like, there was people that wanted it in, but for whatever reason, the management didn't. And I swear... I swear I remember getting Dinesh D'Souza's Obama 2016 instead of it, but they were released a year apart from one another. So I don't know what that's about. Maybe that maybe I was talking to an employee about it coming while that was playing in theaters. Like maybe I was talking to the employee and I remember seeing the theater that had the sign saying, hey, this is playing here. Could have been. Unfortunately, I had to wait for Blu-ray, but it's a good movie. So I wasn't going to... I was going to say it was worth the wait, but eh, I would have liked seeing it in theaters, I suppose. Okay, so before I talk about the movie, before I talk about accuracies, inaccuracies, Disney, Travers, anything like that, let's go over the plot very briefly. I'm not going to go into too much detail, just, just a nice summary, I suppose. In addition to the film being about Travers and Disney's negotiations, it is also about Travers and her relationship with her father, Travers Goff. Uh, P.L. Travers was born Helen Goff. The film opens with a distraught Travers who does not wish to give Disney the rights, but due to financial turmoil from shrinking sales... Sales are dried up. No more royalties. You refuse to write further books, so... Yeah, do you understand? I... I'm frightened you don't understand what that means. She goes to L.A. to negotiate with Walt Disney Studios. Upon arriving in L.A., she is greeted by one of Walt Disney Studios' limo drivers, Ralph, who, well, he's a bit overly friendly, <laughs> and he, he talks a lot, much to the annoyance of P.L. Travers. Oh, no problemo. No problemo. We got a brand new air conditioning system, missus. Yeah. 
make you feel like you're in good old Angerland again. <laughs> well, you know, things they can put in cars these days. Gosh, oh my. When she arrives in the hotel room provided by Walt Disney Studios, she sees it adorned with Disney merchandise, including a Winnie the Pooh stuffed animal. Now, the thing about this is, this was 1961. Disney had only gotten rights to Winnie the Pooh that very year, and only after A.A. A. Milne had passed away, and they had bought the rights from his widow. Oh, A. A. Milne. This is kind of a great image of what she was afraid Disney was going to do to Mary Poppins. She was afraid that they were going to, well, bastardize Mary Poppins. And seeing as how Disney had jumped on the Winnie the Pooh merchandising right from the get-go, it wouldn't be an unreasonable thought. She gets the room in order, throws out the pears. Don't know what the pears thing is about. Like, I'm going to go into accuracies and inaccuracies later, but the pear thing, I, I can't find anything talking about her distaste for pears. If she had a one, this could very well be just a very fictitious thing. Eventually, she gets the hotel room in order until she finds Mickey Mouse in the bed. And, well, I did not notice this the first time watching it, but, um, yeah, Mickey Mouse was in the bed so that she would be getting in bed with Disney. You can stay there until you learn the art of subtlety. I totally missed her line about the subtlety of it. The next day, she is once again greeted by Ralph, much again to her annoyance. She is brought to the Walt Disney Studios in Burbank, California. Here she meets the rest of the main cast, Walt Disney, Dolly his secretary, the Sherman brothers, Robert and Richard, and Don DeGrady. Miss Travers is very off-put by all their demeanor from the get-go, and she finds them to be too casual. Good morning, Pamela. It is so discomforting to hear a perfect stranger use my first name. And Walt Disney had been courting Travers for about 20 years to get the rights for Mary Poppins after making a promise to his daughters Diane and Sharon. P.L. Travers right here in my office. <laughs> for, uh, all these years, almost 20 of them? Hmm, yes. 20 long years. Now, Mrs. Travers just starts butting heads from the very get-go. There will be no animation. The story does not lend itself well to a musical. Why is Mrs. Banks a silly suffragette? And why the heck does Mr. Banks have a mustache? The answer to this last question being that Walt Disney asked for it. Why in the world have you made Mrs. Banks a silly suffragette? I wonder if Emmeline P. would agree with that adjective. <laughs> Quite possibly, looking back. It does seem st strange that Mrs. Banks allows her kids to spend all of their time with the nanny when she doesn't have a job to speak. This isn't Mr. Banks. This, is, this isn't him. Uh, yes, that's Mr. Banks. But he has a set of mustaches. Mrs. Travers, this is a, a specific request from Walt. Mr. Banks in this is kind of portrayed as a surrogate father to both Walt Disney and P.L. Travers. And since Walt Disney's father, Elias, had a mustache, that is why he is insistent on him having a mustache. And since Travers Goff was clean-shaven, that is why Mrs. Travers has reluctance to give him a mustache, even though this is like the only picture of him that exists, and yeah, he ain't clean-shaven. And I guess since we're talking about fathers, let's segue into the other part of the movie, her childhood with her father. Mrs. Travers, again born Helen Lyndon Goff, was, well, she was a total daddy's girl. Her father cared deeply for her and her sisters, but he had trouble holding down a job and they had to move around. Left, right, left, and one, two, three, new town, new job, new bank, new life. As the movie progresses, we find the reason that Travers Goff has had a hard time holding down jobs is because he suffers from alcohol abuse. When Travers becomes ill, one of Helen's aunts moves in and she is incredibly strict, trying to get the sh house in ship shape. When Helen is eight, her father passes away from complications from pneumonia. And this is something that would continue to haunt Travers for the rest of her life. After Travers Goth passes away, Helen's mother attempts suicide but is saved when Helen intervenes. Mrs. Travers, Walt Disney, Don DeGrady, and the Sherman brothers continue on with their negotiations back and forth until the Sherman brothers perform the bank song. I, I can't remember what the song in the movie is called. During this, Mrs. Travers is going between current day and her history with her father, and she remembers a particular scene where her father drunkenly falls off stage when giving a presentation for the bank. As Mr. Banks is a surrogate father, so to say, she lashes out, asking why they have made him so cruel. It works. It works. It's great. It's getting great. It's great. It's great. Why did you have to make him so cruel? He was not a monster. 
The real resolution comes about when the Sherman brothers perform for her Let's Go Fly a Kite, which she sings along with and dances to. Oh, let's go fly a kite When you send it flying up there All at once you're lighter than air You can dance on the breeze of a house and this is important as this is a scene where this is the scene where Mr. Banks is redeemed. After this, Mrs. Travers is much more agreeable, fine with whatever Disney wants to do. So Jolly Holiday is in? Mm, by all means. She's happy with whatever until she finds out that the Jolly Holiday scene is going to include animation. Wonderful. I do have a question about it actually. How in the world does Mr. Disney propose to train all the penguins to? D dance. Can train They're it. animated. Dick. Mr. Travers, what has you so upset now? Penguins. Penguins have very much upset me, Mr. Disney. Animated dancing penguins. One of her stipulations to Disney was, this will not be an animated film. As animation is intended to be included in the film, though, she shuts down the conversation and flies back to London, no deal having been signed. After getting settled back in at home, Mrs. Travers is surprised by Walt Disney at her front door, and Disney goes on a monologue about fathers and their relationships with fathers, and how Mary Poppins did not come to save the kids, a point already made by P.L. Travers, but instead Mr. Banks, her surrogate father. It's not the children she comes to save. It's their father. It's your father. Having been out 3D chess, P.L. Travers agrees to sell Disney the rights, which for the record makes her a very rich woman because uh, she got royalty from it. Three years pass and Mary Poppins is ready to debut. However, Disney has not sent an invitation to the premiere to Mrs. Travers. She shows up anyway and crashes the red carpet premiere. During the show, she breaks down in tears and is comforted by Walt. Despite this, she laments that she cannot abide cartoons. Mr. Banks, going to be all right, I promise. <laughs> I can't abide cartoons. And the film ends with some closing shots from Australia and Mary Poppins, the movie. Okay, so before we talk about accuracies, inaccuracies, whatever, I actually want to talk about a very... S just the similarities between P.L. Travers and Walt Disney. They both had a philosophy that their work was not intended for kids necessarily, but for the young at heart. Write any adult books? Well, you know, I think that Mary Poppins is a grown-up book. I never thought that it was going to turn out into a book that children would read. Don't think for one moment it was written for you. It wasn't. And not only that, but P.L. Travers and Walt Disney both had adopted a child. Diane was Disney's biological child. Sharon was adopted. And that's about it. I mean, they were around the same age. P.L. Travers was two years older, but that's about it. And, um... I will definitely get into P.L. Travers and her relationship with her son, but that's going to be video four in Mary Poppins Month. The, the current timeline is looking Saving Mr. Banks, Mary Poppins Books, Mary Poppins Movie, P.L. Travers Live, and if I have the spoons for it, I'm going to do a recipe. I'm going to do a recipe from Mary Poppins in the Kitchen. A cookery book with a story. Okay, so let's talk about some inaccuracies. Um, the first and foremost, the biggest inaccuracy that I can think of. Well, okay, I shouldn't say the biggest, because there's definitely some big ones here. But I think the most important inaccuracy is that at this meeting, P.L. Travers had already given Disney rights to the movies. In fact, those rights were given to Disney in 1959. What the meeting, what her trip to LA was for was to work as a consultant, a title she has on the film, and go over the script with Disney and crew. Now, actually, um, when I say Disney, I really should say the studios because Walt Disney, um, well, he couldn't stand Travers, so he left for the duration of the meetings to read the script, and leaving most of the negotiations with, with the Sherman brothers. So, you know, okay. 
The Sherman Brothers, if you love Mary Poppins, you have the Sherman Brothers to thank for this. I mean, not only did they help with the negotiations big time, but also, I mean, all the music. They did all that. I mean, the Sherman Brothers, they're, they're amazing. I mean, just a few songs they've done. Everything from Mary Poppins. It's a Small World, if you don't like that, up yours. One Little Spark. The Wonderful World of Color. And, well, there's just a lot more. Oh, Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh comes to mind. They did all the music for the old school Winnie the Pooh. So, shout out to the Sherman Brothers. Um, Robert Sherman passed away a few years back, and his brother Richard is, well, still alive. Well, that sounds macabre. Uh, another inaccuracy. Ralph was not a real character, but Peel Travers was... She was babysitted. Is that the right... Is that the right tense? She was babysat by Disney story editor Bill Dover. P.L. Travers did go to Disneyland. There's no evidence of her having ridden the carousel or really any rides. And uh, the horse on the carousel, Jingles, he wasn't actually named that until 2008 when he was dedicated that by, well, Julie Andrews. I've never lost touch and never lost my feeling of family with Disney, and I am so proud to be a cast member. Mrs. Goff's suicide attempt was real, but it was not actually thwarted by Helen. She did not sing and dance to Let's Go Fly a Kite, but if you listen to the recordings, you can actually hear her sing along with Feed the Birds. Walt Disney never went to London in some kind of emotional plea talking about fathers. That that was totally fiction. And although P.L. Travers did cry at the premiere of Mary Poppins, it should not be taken away that she was moved by the movie. And, um, I said I wasn't going to mention the film version and then let the Sherman brothers deal with her. Does it matter? Bob. You can wait outside. But for adaptational criticisms, more people had a beef with the idea that P.L. Travers was ultimately happy with the film version of Mary Poppins. I'd never picked up something like that any of the times that I watched this movie. In fact, when Disney tries to come for her, she even says something negative. I do not abide cartoons. Mr. Banks, I'm going to be all right, I promise. <laughs> I can't abide cartoons. And... Robert Sherman and P.L. Travers did butt heads, but Robert wasn't as antagonistic as he is in this film. Does it matter? Does it matter? Bob. You can wait outside. Now, just for some accuracies, um... That scene where P.L. Travers makes the little park at Disney Studios, you know, she uses the leaves and the cup and all that stuff, that is actually something she really did do when she was a child. In fact, she was inspired to write that in, in the park with Mary Poppins, where the character Jane Banks was would do the same. I used to make little parks like that. <laughs> and, well, another accuracy that I'm kind of surprised the movie included, um... The screenwriters really did their homework on this movie. Um, when Helen is just a child, and I go between Helen and P.L. Travers and Mrs. Travers. Sorry about that. It just depends when in the life, I guess, I'm talking about her. But in the movie, Mrs. Travers writes a poem for her father, and it's dismissed immediately. Shall I read it to you, father? It's hardly yet. In an, interview, in an interview with a few kids from the, at the Library of Congress, P.L. Travers does actually say that she wrote poems as a kid, and, well, it kind of wasn't taken serious. It's just like, a, oh, how cute. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. So, actually having that in the movie, it's a nice little attention to detail. She liked it. So did my father, but they didn't take much notice of it. They didn't say, ah, oh, here we've got a genius or anything <laughs> like that. They took it as a matter of course. Same way as you eat porridge. 
<laughs> now let's talk about the acting and everything. Um, Emma Thompson as P.L. Travers, she does a fabulous job. And in fact, this first shot with P.L. Travers, just the way she glares is so good. Like, this is, well, this is a great opening shot. So not only does the shout out go to Emma Thompson, but also the director, John Lee, uh, what was his last name? Oh, John Lee Hancock. That's what his name was. Walt Disney being played by Tom Hanks. I'm a little conflicted on. Um, I understand why Tom Hanks would work as Walt Disney. I mean, he does... He's one of those beloved public figures. Kind of seems almost like an uncle. You know, Uncle Walt. So, it makes sense, but I don't see or hear Walt Disney in this performance. He does a great job. Do not do not get me wrong. But he never really sells me as Walt Disney. And actually, I'm going to put a side-by-side -side comparison. Here is, well, A Wonderful World of Disney episode that we get to see also with Tom Hanks in the role. Don't worry, there's nothing wrong nothing with your wrong television, with television set. set. This is a pixie this is bell. A pixie bell. The, the sound, sound is much, much too high, high for human ears. ears. Oh, there oh. you are, Tink. There you are, Tink. Take that stuff off of me. <laughs> hey! Hey! If you're familiar with the story of Peter Pan, you know that a little sprinkling... B.J. Novak and Jason Schwartzman as the Sherman Brothers are fabulous. In fact, they played and sang their own music. Paul Giamatti, who I haven't actually mentioned his character much in this video. Sorry about that. He is actually very likable. Again, he's not a real character, but nor is his daughter Jane, which considering that he's a fake character, why'd they give her the same name as the eldest child from the Mary Poppins books? It just seems weird, but whatever. And Bradley Whitford as Don DeGrady was pretty good. Not a lot to say there, just pretty good. Nothing really... I guess I don't have a lot to say about that role. It's there, and he does a good job with it. Colin Firth as Travers Goff, he does a good job. You know, you fall in love with his character, and you feel bad for him when he succumbs to, well, his alcoholism and then tuberculosis. And, um, this is actually something I never noticed while watching the movie, but, well, I'm just going to use a small clip from Mrs. Ellis's video to talk about how this movie portrays Helen Goff's relationship with her father, Travers Goff. For one, Saving Mr. Banks is the extremely rare father-daughter movie that isn't tied into the daughter finding herself through marriage, but is instead a broader journey about self-identity that you see more often in father-son movies. Oh, and um, I know we're not doing accuracies anymore, but Peel Travers really was not a fan of uh, Dick Van Dyke in the role. She hated Julie and she hated me. Didn't like either one. Really? But this is, even with all the inaccuracies, this is still a very good movie. Like, say what you will about it being Disney whitewashing. I mean, there is some of that, without question. But, well, okay. When I first watched this movie, it made me want to find out more about P.L. Travers. So this is a movie that I find inspires learning for me. And I, therefore, I find it very good. The odd thing that I think about this movie, though, is, um... Well, this movie was released at about... The same time that Mary Poppins Returns was announced, if memory serves correct. And I remember being like, what the hell? Peel Travers was not a fan of Disney's adaptation of her character. Why? Right after saying that, are they releasing a new Mary Poppins movie? But actually, much to my surprise, Peel Travers was actually working on a sequel in the 1980s to Mary Poppins. It fell through, but she was actually working on it. And it was going to be through Disney, from what I understand. So that is actually an interesting thing that I found out recently. Okay. I know what my biggest problem with the movie is, though. This is not how Fantasyland looked like in 1961. I know that, you know, it would be hard to green screen it out, I guess, and put in the old Fantasyland. I guess. What I think they should have done is put a, a green screen tent around the carousel and just fill it in the background. I, but that's just because I'm all kinds of... I'm a stickler about Disney, I guess. <laughs> or I'm a stickler about Disneyland, I guess. It just seems odd that with all of the painstaking details that they do recreate, 
that they don't do that. And actually, these uh, Mickey Mouse balloons that are in the movie, these Mickey Mouse balloons have not been used in quite a number of years. And in fact, they had to be meet the the machine to make these had to be reinvented. The director did take some painstaking measures to get the details right, and yet we have New Fantasyland. And okay, actually, not only Fantasyland, but also the entrance here. Like, um, we have these this the entrance. It's all brick. Disneyland opened, and for quite some time. It was just asphalt there. I mean, the brickwork in front of the gardens, that's all. Th that was all there, of course. But on the ground, that was asphalt. In fact, it kind of looks like crap. But what you going to do? Even with my nitpicks about Disneyland aside, it is still a very good movie. So I would suggest going out and watching it. Again, I didn't go over the full details of the movie. There's things I left out, little bits here and there. So I suggest going and watching this. Um, but anyways, next video is going to be on the Mary Poppins books right there. So, um, yeah, if you want to catch that, you know, check back in a week, I guess. Uh, but uh, thanks for watching, everyone. Take care. Remember that you are valid. Bye-bye.